This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the first epistle of John. First John in the New Testament, almost at the back. Chapter 3, the Christian's love. I've mentioned this before, and it's part of tradition. And you can see this borne out in this little epistle, First John, that John had basically one theme in mind as he was nearing the end of his journey of life. And when he was too old to even really be able to walk successfully on his own, they would carry him into the congregations that he would minister to. And he had really one message. All of his time with Jesus and all of the years of serving Jesus thereafter, it all boiled down to his statement, little children love one another. So when everything else is sorted out and all the problems have been solved and all the affairs of life have been handled, that's the bottom line. Love one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask now that you'll help us to really understand it and really put it into practice. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at the outline for a moment on the Christian's love. Love flows from God through us as Christians and then through us to others. There needs to be an inflow and there needs to be an outflow, ingress, egress. And many times we think we should pray for love. I don't have love, Lord, give me love. But he's already given us love. Paul tells the church in Rome that The love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When we come to Christ and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and he brings the love of God and it has been poured out generously within us. It's like a huge reservoir of water. It's there. And yet, like a reservoir which has a dam that love reservoir can be controlled. Like everything else, it's controlled by us. It's called free will, the greatest of all gifts God ever gave us. And so we can choose to dam that reservoir of love up, or we can open the floodgates and let it pour out. The choice is ours. So no need to say, Lord, may I have love. Rather, Lord, help me to get out of the way. Stop sinning so the love can flow. So we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about the fact, first of all, that uh, God is the author of love, the provider of it. And we're going to see then that love is not a suggested Christian option. It is a command from God. And then finally, we're going to see love by example. And he begins in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, talking about the fact that we have love's author, And that author is God, and we have his love. Verses 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Love comes from God, not something we manufacture. And love, let's be clear about what love is. We like to look at movies and read books and 
romance novels and things like that, and we get a little confused about love. People in practice get a, a lot confused about relationships because they think it's their feelings. I really have strong feelings for you. When you're around, my heart just skips a beat, and I'm just so fulfilled, and I wake up thinking of you, and that's all I can think of. And I am crazy about you. And I guess in the Lord, we've all gone through that. And I, could, I went through that cycle many times. I was what you'd call a six-month lover. I could love you for six months, and almost to the day when six months came, <laughs> either the other person said, oi, or I said, oi, and that was it. And so then I had to get my mind uh, neutral and then off to find somebody else to love. And uh, so it would go. And that accounts for many relationships that uh, fall out. And many times you hear couples will say in counseling, I just don't love him anymore. I don't love her. The feelings aren't there. And so I need to go out and get those feelings all over again. So we think that love is some kind of an emotion which really makes us excited about the other person, like the other person, want to help the other person, be totally absorbed in and by the other person. And boy, if you have that for six months, you're lucky. But that's not what love is. 1 Corinthians 13, which we use so much in wedding ceremonies, tells you what love is. Really, love is service. That's a whole different definition than Hollywood's version, isn't it? Here's what love is. Love suffers long and is kind. Probably love actually suffers longer than six months, wouldn't you think? Uh, love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That to me is a definition of servanthood. What about you? I'm going to lay down my life for you. Now, our divorce rate in this country is over 50%, and some say that for born-again Christians, it's closer to 58 60% divorce rate. Uh, back when I was in India in 1979, I was talking with the pastor I was working with there. Uh, we still work with his orphan ministry that you're supporting. And uh, the divorce rate at that time for the United States was uh, 50%, 0.50, if you're a mathematician. And the divorce rate in India at that time was move the decimal point over 1.05, or what does that translate to be? Half of 1%. And most of those were arranged marriages. It had nothing to do with emotion. It had all to do with commitment. Now, true, in time past, there was an inducement for somebody to stay in the marriage because not only was it in society not right to leave, but in many cases, uh, especially for the young lady, she was told, you don't come home. You leave your husband and you're on your own. So the door was shut once she left. She couldn't go back. But in any event, uh, society has changed and somewhat, even over there, it's been more relaxed. But the divorce rate is still very low. It has nothing to do with feelings. The six-month feeling deal it has to do with commitment. And I'm with you till the end, whether I feel like it or not. And I'm going to ask God for his love to flow through me to make it possible. So with that in mind, let's see about this love. That, of course, comes from God. And God is telling us in verse 1, that the manner of love that he has bestowed on us is that he has made us children of himself. Now, there are all kinds of manifestations of love. But a parent's love for a child is in a category all by itself. And so we have, uh, may I talk to you, Jessica, for a moment as you are pregnant and little Samuel is coming along and well, I presume. And uh, we talk about little Samuel, and we talk to him as he goes out. He's in the womb, and Dad talks uh, to him. And, and uh, is, is Samuel loved? Do we love Samuel? Absolutely. We've never seen him. But all of your lives are dedicated now to Samuel and taking care of him, and he will be yours for as long as you're here. You'll have your love, undying, devotional love. We know the concept. And to be a child and to have that kind of love is wonderful. 
I'm so sorry for the children that don't have that kind of love. And there are those that are abandoned. But little Samuel is going to have the love of mother and father and all that provision and care can provide for. Solomon talked about the fact when I was young and the only one in my mother's eye. And there'll come that time when Jessica's going to hold her child and he'll be the only one in her eyes. And he'll be everything to her and in dad's eyes as well. It's going to be very special. Pray for her pregnancy. Pray for all to go well for the family, please. But that's the idea that God says, I love you so much. I brought you into my family. You're my children. And I've begotten you through the birth, through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, he's calling us children of God. Well, the world doesn't know us because it did not know him. If we're his family, if we're his children, and his nature is within us, we're not divine, but divinity is within us through Christ, then the world doesn't know us because it doesn't know God. Do you have family and friends who just don't understand what you're doing? Oh, they love you, but they just don't understand. I have siblings who don't understand my relationship with Jesus Christ. They love me. I uh, don't really understand it at all. My former law partner, when I retired from the law practice at age 40, thought I was nuts. I walked out on a very prosperous law practice because I was called to the ministry. He said, I think you're crazy, <laughs> but I'm happy that you are, and I'm happy to take the firm over, and uh, oh, he has done very well, and he still is in practice, and he's, he's done very, very well, and I'm grateful for that. But the world doesn't know you. They think you're nuts. Verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God, not just in the future around the throne, but right now. Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I hold on to that verse so many times in the course of a week. I don't know what it's going to be like once I pass from this earthly scene, once I'm around the throne of God with Jesus and family and pets and all of that. I don't know what it's going to be like. But this is as close as I can come in Scripture. It hasn't yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, when we see Jesus face to face, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Like him doesn't mean we're going to be divine, but it does mean we're going to be sinless. We're going to have such a close relationship with him. We're going to be one with him. I've known couples who have been married for many, many years, 50, 60 years, who have learned to work together and to love one another and to flow together. And they really do care for each other and they really speak as one. The old saying is true, one starts the sentence, the other can finish it. And I enjoy being around people like that because they're aware of each other, they care for each other, they work hand in glove together. And that's how it's going to be with us, with Jesus around the throne of God. Well, we're going to be just like him. And then verse 3, the impact that has on my life today is everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So knowing that I'll be with Christ one day affects my personal walk right now. I want to purify myself. I want to please him. I want to be found in him and holy when he returns. And as I do something wrong and I sin and I ask forgiveness, I want to quickly go back and do what's right. And so we purify ourselves. A young lady who is engaged to a young man has the ring on her finger. He needs to leave town, maybe go on a business trip. Perhaps he has to go to a war zone like Iraq or Afghanistan. We would expect her to keep herself pure, wouldn't we? We'd expect her to look at that ring on her finger and say, I belong to my beloved and he belongs to me and I will be safe and I will be pure and my eyes and heart will be his only. Well, Paul tells us that we have an engagement ring. We have a promise and that promise from God is the Holy Spirit. And so you and I can sense and look at the Holy Spirit within and say, that's God's promise that he's going to return. 
My Jesus is away on assignment, building a home for me in heaven. But he's left me the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be looking to the Holy Spirit now and reminding myself I need to be pure for Jesus, for I'll be his bride one day. Well, that's the love that God has for us. And then we also have a command from God, beginning in verse 14. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Oh, I sinned. And we can use the old English expression sin. We know that's a term for archery. We know that when the archers in the days of King Arthur, if he ever existed or whoever, were, or Robin Hood, they would shoot the bow and arrow and they would target practice. How many archers do we have here? Did you ever try to shoot the bow and arrow? I always skinned my hand on those feathers as they went right across the crease of my thumb there. Of course, my bow and arrow cost all of $2.36, I think, so I guess that could be expected. But um, I wasn't very good at it. I, I would shoot for that yellow bullseye, and I'd occasionally hit it. But um, in the old days, they had such a skill that it was the target was so far away, and even in King David's time, that they really couldn't even see the target. It was so far downrange, they couldn't even really see the target well. They could see a general outline, but they sure couldn't see the bullseye. So they'd send a young man down closer to the target to be able to tell them how they did. And they would pull that bow back and shoot that arrow. And uh, if it got the bullseye, there was some indication that he was successful. But if he missed it, the young man would cry out, sin. Missed it. So then you'd have to resharpen your focus to get the arrow into the bullseye. Sin is missing the mark. And that's a good definition, but it can also be misleading in the sense that, oh, I just missed the mark, no big deal. That's why it's good to know that, yeah, you missed the mark, but that's also lawlessness. You have broken the law of God. That's more serious in that definition. Sin is lawlessness. Verse 5, and you know that he was manifested, that's Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Jesus was manifested. The Son of God became flesh and dwelt among us as a human being. And he came to take away our sins. We're going to see this next week. And we're going to see this also in uh, a few other uh, studies. We're going to see this in Jude especially. That we talk about different religions and uh, cults and things. I won't get into that today. But it all boils down to Jesus Christ. When I meet people who are of cults or different religions, if the Lord leads me to discuss religion and they want to know if there's any bridge between us. Uh, there's only one way to establish that bridge. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. And who is he? And is he the son of God? And is he the Christ, the Messiah, the one who has been sent to save us from our sins? Verse 5, he was manifested to take away our sins. Not just to be a prophet, not just to be a teacher, not just to be a sinless human being, but to take away our sins. And in him... There is no sin. When Christ dwells within us through our old, our new nature, there's no sin in that new nature. That new nature doesn't have to sin. It's the old nature that sins. Well, verse 6, if Christ is sinless and he lives within, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So when he abides in you or dwells in you, you're not going to sin. The Holy Spirit's going to say, uh-uh, don't do that. And you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit and you're not going to do it. And you don't have to because the power to sin was taken away at the cross. The power to sin was taken away in your life and mine when you gave your heart to Christ. So whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. The word sin, we need to define that, is in the continuous present tense because we all sin. He told us that also back in chapter 1 and 2. But that continual course of sinning and not caring indicates we don't know him. It also indicates there's no relationship with God because where is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit? If you're a believer and you sin, 
The Holy Spirit is all over you, isn't he? He is all over you, giving you a hard time. And you can't stand it. It's just easier not to sin than it is to have to sin and put up with his working on you and you're having to ask forgiveness, etc., etc. But the person that doesn't have the Lord doesn't have that kind of uh, continual reminder from the Holy Spirit. Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. So it's pretty simple. When you continue to sin, you're not of God. When you continue to practice righteousness, you are of righteous, the righteous one. And the righteousness, of course, comes from him. He who sins is of the devil, verse 8. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So we see that the continual course of sinning and being a child of God is not going to work. It's not uh, consistent. As a matter of fact, verse 8, he who sins is of the devil. There's no neutral ground. There's no middle ground. There's not God on one side and Satan on the other and just a lot of neutral people in between who are atheistic, agnostic, don't know, don't care. Jesus says either you're with me or you're not. You're bringing to me or you're scattering from me. Either we are with the Lord Jesus and he's with us as Lord and Savior or we're not. And if not, then we are sinning, we are of the devil. And the word sin there just, again, means missing the mark or being lawless. And one could be very kind and very generous and very sweet and very loving in the human sense of the word uh, and just the most inoffensive person and yet not really have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That person is lawless. That person is sinning. That person is the child of the devil. So there's no middle ground. Either you're in Christ or you're really in the devil. And he has sinned from the beginning. Now he was made perfect by the Lord. Ezekiel tells us that. And Isaiah talks about that. His name was Lucifer. But he sinned. All we know is that sin was found in him. How it got there, we don't know. But it was from the beginning at that point when he fell. And he has continued to give it to Adam and Eve and to all thereafter. So for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus Christ came here on earth. Now let's go back to verse 5 and look at that same phrase, he was manifested. In verse 5, Jesus was manifested to take away our sins. Now verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus Christ was manifested, verse 5, to take away our sins. Verse 8, to destroy the works of the devil. Do you see the connection there? The work of the devil is to sin and to get us to sin. Jesus Christ was manifested to get us not to sin and not to follow the devil. So the next time you and I are struggling with sin, we've got sinful habits. We uh, think maybe in some cases they were just acquired by us and through habit became very fixed in our lives. In some cases, they might be generational curses that have been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, it could be just something we picked up in society around us, you know, all different kinds of uh, sources, but sin is sin and it's of the devil. And the solution is always the same. And you can medicate it, and you can uh, self-help it, and you can uh, control groups it all you want. You can do all these different kinds of techniques. And I'm not speaking against anything. But I'm telling you, in the final analysis, sin is from the devil, and righteousness is from Jesus. If it doesn't get down to righteousness and Jesus Christ, there really is going to be no help, no solution. Oh, people do give up sinful habits without Christ. They do it every day. But that doesn't bring them closer to Jesus, and it doesn't glorify him, and it doesn't make them saved. 
So if it's sin, it's of the devil. Solution, Jesus Christ. I have the easiest job in the world. Every phone call, every text, every email, (laughs) though I might say a few phrases in scriptures, comes right down to the same bottom line. Jesus Christ, always the solution. And so verse 9, whoever has been born of God, that's by faith in Christ, does not sin. Does not continue to sin without repentance. For his seed remains in him. Talking about birth. In a human birth, there is the seed of the father within that child. In a spiritual birth, there is the seed of God, spiritually speaking, within each child. His nature, not divine, but sinless. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. As we are abiding in Christ, and Christ is ministering to our new nature, we cannot sin. That's an amazing thing. You cannot get your new nature to sin. Your old nature will be very happy to comply with it, but not the new man in Christ. And that's why when you do sin as a believer, you've got that warfare going on. Old nature, new nature. One says yes, the other says no. And that fight goes on between you. The good that I want to do, Paul said, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man within me, who will deliver me from this body of death? And the answer, Jesus Christ. That's it, very simply. So you don't sin as a child of God. Then he says in verse 10, we have God's love. We do not sin. And so now in verse 10, he says, we are commanded to love our neighbor. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. So you can tell them apart. Whoever does not practice righteousness is of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So you're not doing the right thing continually, then you're not of God. And he does not love his brother. You mean to tell me that all the people who are doing good work with the Red Cross and different relief agencies, etc., are not loving their brothers? That's a tough question, isn't it? Many of them do not know the Lord. Many relief organizations are not done in the name of Jesus Christ. They're just humanitarian efforts, and they do good work on the human level. But from the divine level, the divine perspective as directed by God, these are not directed by him. Does he disapprove of them? I can't say that, but that's kind of like our going out and doing good work that he didn't direct. I haven't got time to find out whether that's good or bad. I've got barely enough time to do the good things he tells me to do. So really, it is not loving your brother unless you really do it through Christ. That's why you and I always need to do work that's uh, of the Lord. When you're going to help somebody else out, make sure that person knows that it's Jesus who's doing it. Uh, Make sure that it's Jesus who gets the credit for it because that's where the real love is coming from. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, verse 11, that we should love one another. We saw that last week, and it goes back to Leviticus. Way back in the Old Testament, God said you're to love one another. And here's an example of what not to do. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? Who were their parents? Adam and Eve, right? And uh, they both brought an offering to God, didn't they? Hebrews talks about that. And uh, Abel's offering was acceptable to God. Cain's offering was not acceptable to God. And jealousy arose in Cain's heart. And he killed his brother. And so we find several sins there being manifest in him because he was of the wicked one. We find certainly jealousy. We find murder. But the root cause of all of this had to do with the offering. And the reason Cain's offering was not accepted and Abel's was, was according to Hebrews, 
Cain did not bring his offering in faith, whereas Abel did. He trusted in God and honored God. Cain was doing it as some kind of a grudging obligation, but his heart was not in it and he didn't love God. That's why God says as far as work for me or offerings or what have you, if you can't do it with a loving heart, don't do it. And so we find that Cain was not offering in faith to God, got jealous, killed his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. It went back to their nature. The nature of Cain was wicked because he was of the devil. The nature of Abel was righteous because he was of God. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Didn't Cain hate Abel? Why? Because he was jealous of him. Because Abel's faith and actions exposed the wickedness of Cain's lack of faith and his actions. Now I begin to understand why sometimes family and friends give me a hard time because really they're jealous. They know they're not saved. They know they're not righteous. They know they'll throw it back at us. Well, you think you're better than I am. And you're doing nothing except loving the Lord and trying to love them. And they're just giving you all sorts of attitude. So don't marvel that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So God's love shows us that we're alive in Christ. How do I know I'm born again? Because I love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. And so we love our neighbor as ourselves, Scripture says. The Scripture never says what modern psychology says. You need to love yourself. God's too smart for that. <laughs> he knows we love ourselves all too well. Even if we cut ourselves, even if we inflict pain upon ourselves, who is the focus in our lives? It's always about us, and that's self-love. But he says, I want you to love your brother as yourself. If you don't love your brother, then you abide in death. You're not really alive. Even if you're a born-again believer and you're going through a spell where you're not loving somebody, you don't lose your salvation. But death takes place in the sense that you're not getting that fellowship with God the way you'd like or with others because sin is separating you. Your fellowship is strained. And I've had that happen, and so have you. And I have to go and get it right with that brother or sister and let the love begin to flow. And I found sometimes that I'll find a, a little bit of tension and strain in my life and walk with God. And I've had somebody come to me on one occasion and said, you know, it's pretty obvious you don't love somebody, this person. And I said, is it that obvious? <laughs> did you notice it? I don't think God did, do you? Uh, and so I have to get on my knees and say, God, forgive me. And I want the love to flow. And how, how's the love flow? Jesus said regarding your enemies, love them. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Do good for them. Begin to invest yourself in and reverse it. Love is just the reverse, really, of hate. All the things you were doing negatively, now do positively. And so when you hate your brother, you're a murderer. He says in verse 15, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Murder? Same thing as pulling the trigger? Well, spiritually speaking, yes. And practically speaking, there are accidental murders, but premeditated murder started where? In the heart. So, uh, and many other sins start in the heart and are not accidental. Well, when you hate your brother, as far as God's concerned, that's a spiritual murder. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 5. Talks about that example and also about lust in your heart. You've already committed it as far as God's concerned. So we need to deal with that. And again, I'm going to just give you the exact words of Jesus in Matthew 5 about how to handle this lack of love. We all struggle with it. We have certain people that we really, really do not like. And um, in a sense, they're enemies in our minds. And in Matthew 5, verse 43, he tells you how to handle it. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. 
that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And that evidence is the fact that you're children of God. It shows you're different than the world. Verse 46, if you love those who love you, that's the world, isn't it? What reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, we think we can probably do that until we see the word perfect there, right? Hmm. How do we become perfect? How do we become sinless? Not on our own. We go to God and say, Lord, I can't do it. Forgive me for the hatred that I feel or the antagonism or what have you. And I'm going to ask you now to heal my heart. And I'm going to ask for your love to flow through me and teach me how to love. Teach me how to care. And the Lord's going to be all too happy to do it. All right, now we see the outworking of love here in verse 16. A love's example. We love in service and we love in truth. It's got to be real. Verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. To know love means to absolutely know it by experience. We can know love by the example of Jesus Christ and his example for putting his life on the line for us. He laid down his life for us. That's love. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How do you lay down your life for the brethren? Going back to that definition in 1 Corinthians 13, it's love is service, right? I'm here to serve. How may I serve you? How will I do that today? I have no idea until I get up and the phone starts to ring or the texts start to come in or the emails come on in or the doorbell rings and I'll just take it step by step and incident by incident. And if I take the attitude, you are bugging me, you are draining me, you are cornering me, then I'm going to have a very, very long day and a surprising absence of communication with God. If I take the attitude, I am ready to serve, I'm ready to be interrupted, I am ready to do whatever the Lord shows me to do for somebody, I am here not for me, but for others. I will trust God to protect me and my space and my time and take care of all the needs that I have, but I'm here to serve. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a tremendous day. And incidentally, we all have a lot to do every day, and time becomes a great factor, usually an enemy if we're fighting the clock. And I have found the best way to become efficient and happy is to put the day literally in God's hands and say, Lord, I'm not going to take the phone off the hook. I'm not going to avoid the text. I'm not going to hide under my pillow. I'm going to be out there for you, and I'm going to trust you to organize my schedule. And I've seen him do that, and so have you. And he brings people in unexpectedly, and the needs are met, and they leave when they need to leave, and the next one comes. And next thing you know, you've got some quiet time, some private time, time to do whatever you want to do for yourself. That's the way to do it. Give the life to God by laying down your life for the brethren. Verse 17, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So James, the brother of Jesus, talks about that. Somebody is in need and you say, oh, be well or be warm, but you offer nothing to help. Then you're shutting up your heart. It's only lip service that you're giving. How does the love of God really abide in you? Remember, love is from God. God demonstrated his love by sending Jesus to the cross Jesus gave his life for us. That's the example, and that's the power within us. It's not just an example. An example could be extraneous. I saw Jesus lay down his life, and I've got to follow that. No, it's not only the example. It is the power within. That self-sacrificing life is in me. Jesus is in me, and he will enable me to do this. And you'll be able to do extraordinary things that you didn't think possible. We're praying for 
two friends, and we can call them Judy and Robert because they are Judy and Robert, and that's as far as we're going to go because they're on our prayer team. I've known them for over 30-some-odd years, and we've been talking about them. Please don't stop praying. But here's a retired couple, and they are now in country in a very, very wicked land known for piracy, and the piracy is being shut down on the high seas in greater measure, and they're now going inland, and it's an almost exclusively black country, and they are white, and uh, hostages are taken for great sums of money. Their predecessors were killed. Husband and wife watching television one night, invaded, bullet through their head. The agency pulled out of that country for a few years and said, we still need to get back in. So Judy and Robert just arrived, and you're praying for them. What would ever impel them to do that? They don't know these people. They're praying to come to know them, to have relationships because of Jesus Christ, truly putting their lives on the line for the brethren. Their son who got them involved with missions is also training with his wife who's pregnant, and they're learning the Arabic language. Judy and Robert had to learn this other language, which is much more complicated. And the son said to them, jokingly but seriously, well, mom and dad, you've led good lives. And uh, the idea was you might not make it. And when I had lunch with them recently, I realized that way deep down inside, there was that thought in their minds and mine, and I may never see them again. But they're laying down their lives for the brethren because their plan is to be able to reach people for Christ. Pray, pray for Judy and Robert. God knows who you're praying for. Laying down your life. Only Jesus can do that. And I knew them both before Christ, and they knew me before Christ, and that was not Judy and Robert, and that was not Jerry. That's Jesus. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's be real about it. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So you're going to know that you really are true when you're able to lay down your life for the brethren, when you're able to serve. There's nothing like that feeling of service. Paul talks about that when he quotes Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We've all had to ask, and we've all been able to give. We'd all rather give, wouldn't we? We hate to ask, but there are times for asking and there are times for giving. And we, have, we know our hearts are assured before God as we are loving the brethren and we're on good terms with God. For if our heart condemns us, verse 20, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So I may be doing the right thing, but the devil begins to get on my mind and say, you're not doing enough. You ever get that kind of a word from him? Um, you just, you did something. You know, <laughs> I go to the hospital, work my schedule around uh, late at night, miss uh, some other situation and do the hospital visit. And, oh, praise God. And then the thought comes in here. You just did that. So you could uh, earn a paycheck or just show off or this or that. And uh, then you got to really, was that of God or was that true self-confession? You don't know. So you have to go to God and say, God, you're greater than my heart. You be the arbiter. And if I was doing it selfishly or begrudgingly, then forgive me and give me a better attitude the next time. And if I didn't, get behind me, Satan, and praise the Lord. So if your heart condemns you, God's greater than your heart. Or maybe you did something wrong and your heart did condemn you. Well, God's greater in the sense that he can forgive you as you confess it and teach you not to go that way again. But if your heart, verse 21, does not condemn you, you have confidence towards God. You know that you've done what's right because it's the love of Christ that's impelling you. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's interesting. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Does that mean that whatever you ask for, you're going to get? Well, we'd like to say no, but there is a yes in there. We ask, if whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. There's your qualifier. No, you don't get whatever you ask for. But if you're doing his commandments and you're pleasing in his sight, 
Yes, when you ask, you will get it because you are asking according to his will. You are in fellowship with him. You're in sync with him. And therefore, you're being directed by him. And the more you look into prayer, you'll realize that not only is he not just waiting for you to ask, but he probably impelled you to ask in the first place that he might be able to give it to you. So as you are in his will, doing his commandments, doing those things that please him, as a need comes up, ask. Because you know you're right in the will of God and you're going to get it. And this is his commandment, verse 23, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So his commandment is basically very simple. 613 laws in Leviticus get awfully complicated. But they all come down to really the one, the law of love. But even more basic than that, in order to get that love, all can be reduced to this one commandment. Believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. So that means you are believing and trusting in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the Messiah, the word Christ, Christos in the Greek, Mashiach in the Hebrew is Messiah, the anointed one of God, the anointed one for salvation, the anointed one for provision of our lives. And that's the Jesus Christ we're talking about. We're not talking about the Jesus Christ who's the fifth most important prophet. We're not talking about the Jesus Christ who is the brother of Lucifer. We're not talking about Jesus Christ, the most perfect sinless man, less than the Son of God. Those are other Jesuses. No other religion, no other faith system than that of the born-again Christian has this Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So when you're talking to somebody of another faith, realize it's not the same Jesus. Pray for that person that he or she will come to know that Jesus. I was in a cult for many years and did not know this Jesus and did not get saved and truly born again until I recognized Jesus Christ was the Son of God and God the Son and God's only Messiah, only provision. That's all he offers is his son, and that's the only way we can come to him. And, he says, because he's in you and his love is in you, now you love one another as he gave commandments. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. By this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So, when we keep his commandments, we abide in him. We know that he also abides in us, close fellowship. And we know that he abides in us because we have the Holy Spirit within us. And the Holy Spirit was given to us to let us know that we belong to God. That's the promise. That's the engagement ring. That's the promise. I will come for you and also you are my child and my property and possession even now. So it's love. And as I often like, like to say, the Beatles were right. In that song, all you need is love. <laughs> but um, probably a different kind of love than they're talking about there. That is the essence, and that's the proof. And if we don't have that, then we have trouble. We need to be there to meet the needs of others. And um, I want to give you a little bit of a postgraduate course here, which is a, a little bit off the record, a little bit of personal experience that hopefully will help you. Much of my day is meant, uh, obviously, ministering to people, largely through prayer, counsel, giving scripture, sometimes giving uh, finances. And uh, there are those who are in legitimate need, and we are here to meet those needs. We talked about that today. But are there illegitimate needs? Are there situations that arise where somebody is wanting us to just be an enabler? And they're going to be taking the money and they're going to use it for drugs and they're going to continue with their old habits and they're going to con us and what have you. Does that ever happen in ministry? You see, God knows the word and Christians know the word, but you know, the devil knows the word and the unbeliever knows the word, the con artist knows the word. And so they know that a soft touch is going to be the church, your family. Every family probably has a freeloader. 
you know, <laughs> not you, of course, but uh, somebody, or if it's not, then you're a blessed family. My family had them. Every family's had them. And that makes it more difficult. And yesterday I was being bombarded by texts by somebody uh, who was, has been a freeloader, going through more money this week with us than should be in a lifetime, still wanting more, 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 more. The usage was so fast, it was not even human that this person wasn't using this for food and shelter because it was a bigger habit than that. And the texts kept coming, and they started coming just as I was about to do the radio program for this message. And I'm about to do it, and I'm closing off the, the text and saying I'm going to close it off. And I'm teaching all about giving and opening your heart and sharing, and I just know when I finish, I'll turn that phone on, and I'll be bombarded. I finished the message, so guilty and heavy laden, and turned the phone on, bing, 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 20 times in an hour and a half. I need this, I need this, please, I need it, $60, $60, $60, please, please, $60. We'd already given $500 and $600 already this week for food, and the person's still hungry. So I said, I just can't stand this anymore. I said, I'm sending $100, <laughs> Western Union, $100. And I'll be honest with you, I wanted to just buy some peace and quiet. Got up this morning, it's raining. Walking the dogs in the rain, watching the softball players in the rain. Bing, 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 bing. I need, I need more money, I need more money. You want to buy a CD Walkman? This person's out of town. I don't want to buy a CD Walkman. More money, more money, more money. $20, $20, $20. I come to church. I'm talking to the elders. Bing, 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 bing. I can't wait to get my, my phone when I finish here. Point being, you've got a scripture that says you're to give. But you've also got a situation where you know that it's just going in the wrong direction and the person's not changing and it's just going down the hole. And I want to mention this because God doesn't give you any direct counsel in his word about that. He doesn't say give unless after assessing it, you think it is not a legitimate need. He doesn't say that. Doesn't mean he's wrong. It's just he gives you the general impetus here to give. So I said, what's the answer, Lord? I'll be getting into the pulpit and I'll be facing more bing, bing, bings all day. What do I do? And the Lord said, you pray, and you get your, your elders around you. So I talked to the elders, and we prayed about this to get other counsel. My heart is to give, but also my reason tells me this is going in the wrong direction, and this is that I called the person's father, found this is a lifelong history. It's a 33-year-old woman, continue to do the same thing, always been like that. All the counsel is saying, you're going to have to cut her off. You're going to have to let her learn her lesson. That's extremely hard to do. So you're going to get cases where they're very difficult cases in your family and others. And you're going to say, if I keep giving, A, I'll go bankrupt, and B, uh, this person's not going to really learn anything from it. So if your heart's right, your heart's not condemning you, and you know you want to give, it's always right to pray. And it's always right to get counselors around you to say, what do you think? And then wait upon the Lord to speak in between the bing, bing, bings of the text, and God will speak. Do I have the answer on this one? Not yet. Tune in next week. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm changing my phone number as soon as we leave the pulpit here. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask you to help us now to really allow you to do in us what you already have done. You have poured out in our lives and our hearts your love. Help us to just simply open the floodgates and say, whosoever will. Help us, Lord, to give and to love and to share and to serve. But let it be by your direction. Because there are those who will just try to drain our wallets to support their habits. And those who will try to get us to do their work, which they're supposed to do themselves. And that's not what you're telling us to do. So we need to, Lord, always come back to Jesus and say, Lord... I'm willing to give, I'm willing to share, I'm willing to serve, but I must get direction from you and not from the person. And if the person is screaming so loud and texting those dings in my ear that I can't hear you, help me to come apart and be still and quiet and listen to you and get direction from you. Because any giving and any serving 
that is driven by somebody else and not by you is not of you, will not be blessed by you, and is a misappropriation of your funds and time and service through your servant. So I guess, Lord, it all gets back to you. Wisdom, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So